My name is Deepa J. Seelan. I'm one of the consultant neurologists. I co-lead the service um, with Prof. Hannah. And I thought we'd kick off um, in terms of the general information session this morning about what a muscle channelopathy is. There's a real variety of you here today. Some of you have had new diagnoses. Some of you have been with the service for a very long time. But the idea is we just try and get everybody up to speed with um, what the different muscle channelopathies are. So I, just to overview what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to start with what defines a muscle channelopathy, what types of muscle channelopathy they are, and then I'm going to go into the different conditions. So a lot of you will have lots of different conditions. Some of you will have myotonia, and I'll talk about that. Some of you will have periodic paralysis, and I'll talk about that. And then I'm just very briefly talk about some top tips for each of the conditions that often the patients have given us. Um, a little, very brief talk about how you can get the disease, how it's inherited, and briefly talk about what treatments are available at the moment. So first of all, what is a channelopathy? So uh, Prof. Hannah just touched on this just now. So a ch channelopathy is a disease caused by the iron channel not working. So it's due to a problem in the iron channels in your muscle. And essentially, it's caused by a mistake in the gene that your body codes for the protein that makes the channel. So there's a mistake in the gene. So the, the protein that's made isn't made correctly for whatever reason. So either the mistake might make the channel not work properly, or maybe it'll make not allow you to make the channel at all. So you don't have enough of the channel. And depending on what condition you are, it, the mistakes work in slightly different ways. So if your channel doesn't work properly, what happens? Well, it stops our body from sending the correct signals to our muscles or our nerves. And that's what manifests with the myotonia or the paralysis that people feel. So just to give you an overview of the different types of muscle channelopathy. So there are two main types when we see people in the clinic. Um, there'll be those of you who have stiffness and myotonia, which we call the non-dystrophic myotonias. And there'll be those of you who have mainly episodes of weakness, which is what we call the periodic paralyses. Now, a lot of you will have some overlap between the two. So if we think about the different conditions that you all have, some of you will have myotonia congenita, which is at this end of the spectrum. Hopefully you can see my mouse, where you'll have predominantly stiffness, and that will be the greatest problem usually. And then some of you will have things like anderson torval syndrome or hypokalemic periodic paralysis. And for those of you who have that, it tends to be that the weakness, the episodes of weakness and sometimes prolonged weakness will be the main problem. And then there are lots of you who will have things in the middle where things like paramyotonic congenita, where you have a bit of stiffness and a bit of weakness. And from person to person, that can vary what proportion you have. And there'll be those of you who have hyperkalemic periodic paralysis where you have more weakness, but also you get episodes of stiffness and myotonia. So we find there's a huge spectrum and people lie somewhere on this spectrum and therefore treating you will often in the clinic have a look at what, what symptoms are worse and how we can target those symptoms specifically because each person is very individual. So having had a look at the types of channelopathy, where is the actual problem that occurs to give you that channelopathy? So if you have a problem in your chloride channel, so this one here, this is the muscle that you're looking at in this picture down below, and this is the chloride channel, which is in your muscle. If you have a mistake in your chloride channel, that's when you get myotonia, or myotonia congenita. If you have a mistake in your calcium channel or your potassium channel, which is here and here, the orange and the green, then that will usually give you episodes of paralysis. That will be your main problem. Now, those of you who have problems in your sodium channel could have either myotonia or paralysis, depending on what kind of mistake you have. And sometimes people will have both. So where your mistake is in which gene it is in will tell you what type of condition you are likely to have. So let's talk about what myotonia is. So myotonia is the term we use for difficulty relaxing the muscle after you use it. So you go to do something and then you go to try and relax your muscle after you've done it, for instance, gripping your hand and you go to relax it. And actually that is really difficult. So the problem with myotonia is relaxing your muscle. It happens because the muscle stays contracted. It gets stuck and it can't open up. 
And how does it manifest? So most people talk about it feeling like stiffness, it feeling like locking or cramping, and some people get pain with it as well. It essentially will happen in any of the skeletal muscles. So it's not going to happen in muscles that aren't skeletal muscle. It's going to happen in the muscles that like your arms or your leg muscles, and some people their eye muscles or face muscles, their back muscles. But which muscles you tend to have affected the most will depend on which type of channelopathy that you have. So depending on which gene is affected, you will have stiffness in different locations. And then again, people vary, it varies from person to person. So one person will have a lot in their eyes and very little in their legs, and the next person will have a lot in their legs and very little in their face. So what about periodic paralysis? So periodic paralysis is when you have attacks of weakness, you have episodes of weakness. Now, the reason periodic par paralysis happens is the muscle stops receiving the signal. So when you go to contract something, your muscle gets a signal to contract, to, to tighten up. And then for because there's a problem in your gene, it can't contract anymore. And even though you're asking it to contract, it just won't work. It's just not receiving the signals anymore. So you feel weak because you can't make the muscle work. Usually in periodic paralysis, people don't have weakness all of the time. It's often triggered by something. And depending on what type, it'll have different triggers. So it could be triggered by um, eating uh, carbohydrate meals. It could be triggered by um, uh, doing a lot of exercise or maybe rest after exercise. So the types of trigger that you have will depend on which channel is not working properly. So patients can have food, particular food triggers and sometimes keeping a food diary can be useful. Sometimes strenuous exercise or the rest after doing exercise can trigger an attack. In between attacks, patients usually don't have symptoms, but that's not always the case. But for most people, especially younger patients, that will usually be the case. OK, so I'm going to talk about the key channelopathies. So first of all, myotonia congenita. So quite a large number of you on the call today will have this condition. And the main problem in myotonia congenita is myotonia rather than weakness. The symptoms tend to be worse when you start moving. So when you've been sat for a long time, for instance, on a tube train or in a bus, and then you go to get up to move, that's when you get the stiffness at its, at its worst. And the stiffness will warm up. What does that mean? So that means that the more you work that muscle that's stiff, the better the stiffness gets, the, the better you're able to relax that muscle. So often people will try keeping their muscles moving when they're sitting. The legs are often worse than the arms, but that's not always the case. And you need to be really careful when you're trying to move after a long period of rest, because that tends to be when you fall over. So when you're starting a race or when you're starting to do something, that's going to be your highest likelihood of falling. In some conditions, so in some patients with recessive myotonic congenita, they may get a little bit of weakness when they first start to move, when they first start to get the stiffness. But as they start to move their muscle a bit more, the, that weakness goes, goes away. So we call that transient weakness. So in terms of top tips, what top tips have patients given us? So one of the top tips was try to keep your muscles moving when you're sitting down. And the other top tip was stand up a few stops earlier. So when you're on the tube, well, stand up a few stops before you're due to get off, just so you can warm up your muscles and you're not suddenly thrown off guard. So next, paramyotonia congenita. So this is the one that's caused by problems in your sodium channel. Now in paramyotonia congenita, again, patients tend to have mainly myotonia. But as you saw in that slide earlier, where we talked about it being a spectrum, they can also get weakness or paralysis with their attacks. Often it's stiffness and then they feel weak afterwards rather than weakness separately. But some people do get separate episodes of weakness as well. Now, usually in paramyotonic congenita, it's the face and eyes that are the most affected. But again, as I say, it's not always the case. Each person's individual. But one of the most important features of this condition is that people seem to be much, much worse in the cold. So in the winter, often that's when patients need treatment. That's when people find they really struggle with exercise. They struggle to, to go out and do things, for instance, in the snow. In paramyotonic congenita, it's different from myotonic congenita. Rather than finding that you need to warm up a lot and then you get less stiff and less stiff as time goes on, people can sometimes get a little bit worse after exercise. So if you exercise heavily, they may feel much, much stiffer. So what about our top tips? So 
thermals and lots of layers in the cold. That can be really helpful in the winter months. Try and keep your muscles as warm as possible. And the other top tip, think about where you're sitting. So in an office, you're going to think you're going to be really nice and warm. But actually, if you sit under the air conditioner, that can really trigger quite bad stiffness. So just be aware of where you're sitting, how much heat there is. Are you near, near a radiator? Can you keep warm enough? Okay, so we'll go on to the periodic paralysis. So hypokalemic periodic paralysis. So this typically is when patients get episodes of weakness and it's triggered by a low potassium. They're not always low, but generally when your potassium goes really low, that's when you tend to have your worst attacks. Typically people will wake up with the attacks early morning or in the middle of the night. So it tends to occur in the nighttime when you're sleeping. And these attacks can be really long. They can last several hours to days and often will affect your arms and your legs quite badly if you're having a bad attack. Now, what are the main triggers? So most people find that eating a big carbohydrate meal, so having a massive pizza dinner, um, chips, those kinds of things, late at night especially, can really trigger a bad attack the, the next morning. Big Chinese meal is another one that often people suggest. And the other thing that can often trigger attacks is strenuous exercise. So if you're working really, really hard and doing a lot of exercise, often the next day you, you can wake up weak. So what are the top tips? So small, regular meals through the, throughout the day can help with your symptom control. Trying to avoid eating that massive carbohydrate meal late at night just before you go to bed. Try and bring your, your dinner meal forward a bit. And the other tip is to know your triggers. So keep a, a food diary, see what foods might trigger your attacks. Think about you know, what level of exercise might trigger your attacks and try to avoid those things or try to just even things out a little bit. And you might find that it can improve your symptoms quite considerably. So what about hyperkalemic periodic paralysis? So patients with this condition tend to have a slightly different set of problems they actually have episodes triggered by usually high potassium. Sometimes it can be with normal potassium, but usually with high potassium. So attacks are usually are much shorter, so they tend to last a few hours. And rather than affecting your whole body, typically they can just affect one limb. But there are some people who get significant whole body attacks. What are the key triggers? So most people find that if they have loads of bananas, tomatoes, things that are high in potassium, that can trigger a bad attack. But often the biggest thing is they do a lot of exercise and then rest for a period of time. And that seems to really trigger attacks. What, what were the top tips for this? So stress can make symptoms worse. So try and mediate your stress. Easy for me to say. It's not very easy to do, I know. And things like staying hydrated and keeping warm during surgery. Again, patients are often very cold sensitive in this type of condition because it, it's mediated by the sodium channel. So just try and keep warmed up uh, warm as much as possible. All right, and finally, anderson toole syndrome. So anderson toole syndrome is a slightly different condition in that it doesn't just affect the muscles like all the others. Patients tend to have episodes of weakness, just like the other periodic paralysis that can be triggered by either high or low potassium levels. So we're aiming to try and keep your potassium levels as even as possible. But also patients can have heart rhythm problems. So it's really, really important that you see a cardiologist every year to keep an eye on your heart and patients can have specific features such as smaller hands and feet or they might be a little bit shorter. So when we see you in clinic, we might mention those things. There's nothing to worry about from that, but it's just one of the ways it, that helps us diagnose the condition. So top tips, always give yourself a little bit more time when you're doing things and take each day of time. Try and pace yourself through the day. And um, Sarah and Nicola will talk about pacing and, and how exercise can help later on. So I'm going to very briefly talk about how we get the disease. So these conditions are all inherited. What does that mean? So it means that it's usually a mistake in your gene. So there's a mistake in your gene that has caused the condition. Now, often it's passed down your, from your parents. It's not always the case. Sometimes you could be the first person to have the mistake. But often it's passed down from your parents. And, and we'll sometimes say to you, we think we should test your parents as well and find out where it's come from. So now for most of these conditions that we talk about today, they're dominant. So in other words, you have a 50-50 chance. If your mum or dad has it, you have a 50-50 chance of getting the mistake from your parents. It also means you have a 50-50 chance of passing it on to your children. But what we do definitely find and what I hope I've 
reiterated throughout the talk is that different people manifest in different ways. So you can have exactly the same problem in your gene and you'll be different from your brother or your sister. So different people can have different severity. So in myotonic congenitor, there are two forms. There's a recessive form and a dominant form. So in the recessive form of myotonic congenitor, and we will usually tell you if that's the type you have, it's not dominant. So in other words, you get one mistake from your mum and one mistake from your dad, and it's the combination of those mistakes together that give you the condition. If you have recessive myotonic congenitor, your parents are carriers. So they will have a mistake each, but they won't actually have any, any problems with myotonia. And it means that if that's the case, that you're very unlikely to pass it down to your children. If you are ever unsure which type of condition you have, whether it's dominant or recessive, just ask us in clinic, ask us after this, and we'll be able to tell you usually we spend a bit of time talking about how it's inherited, the likelihood of passing it on, so that you all have a little bit of experience of what's going on. Okay, so I'm going to whiz through over the last couple of minutes treatments, and you'll hear a lot about these as the day goes on. So avoiding triggers is probably the single most useful thing that all of you can do. So work out what your triggers are, keep a food diary, keep a diary of what thing that, you know, the days you're bad and what you did that day before. But often temperature can be a big trigger. So in things like paramyotonic congenitor and hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, people often are very cold sensitive. But even in the other conditions, people can find that getting cold or that change from hot to cold can trigger attacks or trigger myotonia. Food can also be a big trigger. So depending on which type you have, if you have a hypokalemic periodic process, carbohydrates can be really bad. If you have hyperkalemic, potassium tends to be a big trigger. And then exercise. So strenuous exercise in a lot of these conditions will often trigger attacks, often the next day or after you've had a period of rest afterwards. So what about treatments? So both of the two sets of conditions, the myotonia and periodic process, are treated slightly differently. If you have myotonia, then there are, a couple, there are quite a few treatments out there, but usually we'll offer you either mixilatine or lamotrigine in the clinic. So mixilatine is rapidly acting. It kicks in in about half an hour, and it can be very effective because it targets that sodium channel where there's a problem with the stiffness. We've shown in our studies that it's safe in the long term, and we have lots of patients on it, but you will have to have an ECG before you start it. You'll have to have regular ECGs for monitoring because we can't use it if you have heart problems. You can, probably the biggest side effect people have is reflux. So they get acid, the acid feeling. But if you take it with food, it tends to settle that, it tends not to be so much of a problem. And then the other medication we've started using more and more now is lamotrigine, which again can be really effective the only disadvantage is you have to slowly titrate it up and you can't just take it now and again. You kind of have to build up your dose. So it takes a little bit longer. 10% of people will get a rash. So we always advise you to watch out for a rash. We'd have to stop it if you got a rash. The big advantage with lamotrigine is it's actually safe to use in pregnancy. So if you're having really severe myotonia, we can think about it in pregnancy. So the other things we've been using, magnesium, We'll talk about that a bit later, that has varying effects, carbamazepine, acetazolamide, flaconide, and phenytoin. And if the other two medications haven't worked for you, we might offer you one of the others. And then finally, treating periodic paralysis. So with hypokalemic periodic paralysis and anderson torval syndrome, we'll often give you potassium supplements for when you have the attack, because potassium is low. It might give you acetazolamide to try and prevent the attacks. And if that none, neither of those things are working, we might give you something like a milleride or spironolactone, which is a potassium sparing diuretic. In hyperkalemic periodic process, we usually use acetazolamide first line, and we might use things called the thiazide diuretics. The acetazolamide is really well tolerated. We'll use it for most types of periodic process, but it can give you some tingling and numbness in the hands, and it's really important you keep hydrated. You will need regular kidney ultrasounds because a small proportion of people get kidney stones if they're on it on a high dose for a long time. So we'll ask you to get yearly ultrasounds. Okay, and that's it from me. So thank you for listening.